it's going to be a great session. Um, before we start, I'd like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we're all meeting from today across the country. In in my case, it's um, I'm joining from Bundjalung country um, on the border of Queensland and New South Wales in Coolangatta here. And um, if you'd like, just um, as I mentioned, introduce yourselves, where you're joining from, um, and your organisation, and and yeah, we'll we'll have a, a nice little chat there. Okay, just a reminder, we're also recording um, the session today, so they'll be able you'll be able to access that after um, the webinar, and we'll circulate that at the end um, of the session. Um, so as I said, we're we're hearing today. We're going to be hearing about equity and ethics in public health. And we've got two fantastic speakers. We have um, Bridget and Kez here joining us today, so I'll introduce them both. So uh, Dr. Bridget Hare is a senior research fellow at the Kirby Institute at UNSW and an associate of the Australian Human Rights Institute. She's trained in bioethics and conducts research in areas of research ethics, public health, sexual health and infectious diseases. I wonder if I can turn off my, sorry if you're hearing all the, the alerts there. Um, but yeah, Bridget, she's published extensively in HIV prevention and is a former president of Australia's peak body for the community response to HIV. And she's committed to conducting research in partnership with affected communities. Bridget's also published on ethical issues in the control of Ebola and COVID-19 and has recent um, her recent COVID-19 related publications include studies on the impacts of hotel quarantine and evaluation of the COVID safe app and human rights implications for vaccine mandates and passports. Uh, so welcome, Bridget. We've also got Kezia Bennett Brook joining us. Um, Kezia is a Torres Strait Islander woman and program head of uh, I should have asked Kez how I actually say that. Um, Gunumana. Gunumana Heal Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Program at the George Institute for Global Health um, and the, Austra the Australasian Injury Prevention Network Executive Member and Indigenous Committee Lead. Kezia chairs the research committee for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health since 2017 and leads the development and implementation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research strategy, policy, stakeholder partnerships and Indigenous research coordination within the Global Research Institute. Kezia has extensive experience in social and cultural determinants of health, Indigenous methodologies and knowledge translation and impact measurement that privilege Indigenous knowledges as well as applying decolonisation methods to organisational and systems change. Kezia leads implementation of strategic organisational activities to increase cultural safety and capability within global health research. Uh, so welcome to both of you. We're going to first hear from Bridget um, and then Kez will, will give us a perspective um, on the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health equity and ethics as well. So welcome to you both. We'll, I'll pass over to you, Bridget, to get things underway. Thanks so much, Maddie. Just a moment while I seamlessly, we hope, uh, share my screen. So to begin with, I would like to um, acknowledge the tradi traditional custodians on the land from which I'm presenting, which is the Bidjigal people. I'd like to pay my respects to elders, past, present, and extend my respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here. And of course, I acknowledge my, my fellow presenter and colleague, um, Kezia, here, and to anybody, any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, who are joining here online or who later watch the recording. I would like to acknowledge that this was, is, and always will be Aboriginal land. So, I'm going to be talking to you today about ethics and equity in public health policy. Ethics is the study of what we should do. And in my field of public health ethics, we strive to answer the question, what should we do to maximise the health of populations in whatever specific contexts are under discussion? And arguably, equity, equity is incredibly important in this discussion because arguably the key tension in public health ethics is balancing health equity with the greatest good for the greatest number and individual liberty. 
The concept of health maximisation is a useful one. So health maximisation brings together the consequentialist idea of maximising good outcomes alongside an equity lens that requires that hard to reach populations or populations living with entrenched disadvantage are not left behind. So note that this is not, um, health maximisation is not simply about a utilitarian calculus that aims to maximise a good overall, which can leave some underserved populations. Um, it's about the idea of leaving no one behind. So there's that, that equity lens that comes in on the hard to reach populations or um, populations who are living with entrenched disadvantage. So in this presentation, I want to refresh your memories about the evidence of the importance of social determinants and provide some examples about um, equity based um, uh, public health interventions. So I'm going to present some evidence about the importance of social determinants, and this will be a bit of a refresh for you because I understand that you are public health people. I'm going to provide some examples of relatively macro level changes to policy and or legislation that addressed equity in the field of HIV prevention. I'm going to talk about what do we need to think about when designing policies and programs? And what do we need to think about when undertaking research? So in public health, we recognise that patterns of disease are associated with the conditions in which people live, work, socialise, have sex, raise families, as well as what they eat, whether and how they exercise, and whether or how they access health care. This recognition is ethically important because it moves us away from discourses of blame towards discourses of social change, structural change, from individual responsibility to social responsibility for the health of all. So how do we know that social determinants impact health? And this will be revision for some of you. In one of the early accounts of social determinants, um, a clinician, scientist and anthropologist went to investigate some typhus outbreaks in Silesia, Prussia in 1848. His account of the epidemic situated it in terms of the social, economic and political problems experienced by the affected citizens at the time and argued that irrespective of the bacterial cause, it was these factors, these social factors that allowed the outbreak to cause its devastation. In another account that began just over a century later, Thomas McCowan got access to records, we'd now call them a data set, that spanned English parishes for more than 360 years and found that life expectancy doubled in that time, unrelated to advances in medicine. The contribution of public health measures to this is contested. McCowan's analysis suggested they made a small difference, but later analysis suggests that they played a greater part. The McCowan thesis is that access to medical care is not a prime determinant of health and its distribution in populations. Then there are the Whitehall studies. This is a set of studies that followed more than 18,000 people longitudinally and showed in stark contrast to the researchers' hypothesis. So they were not expecting this outcome at all. They were expecting quite the opposite. That there was an increase in cardiovascular disease that was almost stepwise as you went down the pay gradient. Those at the top showed the lowest mortality and those at the bottom, the highest. And the relationship was also there in the middle grades, giving rise to the expression, the social gradient of health. Now, notably, this was in the UK and the national health system was in place during this study. So the whole participant po population would have had access and free access to health care. So that alone does not explain the difference. I now want to go on to show you my all-time favourite example of, um, of a public health intervention that's going right in and addressing macro social causes. Oh. This is the Homes for Heroes program, a groundbreaking program in social housing, which was instigated by the UK Minister of Health, Dr Christopher Addison, in the Housing Act of 1919. So this was a health minister and what he put in place was a housing problem. This is real public health thinking. Um, the program was called Homes Fit for Heroes. 
And it was about actually providing decent housing for men who were returning from um, the front at World War I. The rationale was it was unthinkable to rehouse men who re returned from the horrors of the, the, the tr of trench warfare in World War I to the slum housing that many of them came from. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could do this now? Imagine our health ministers instigating a housing program. Now I'm going to fast forward us about 70 years. I wanted to highlight the discriminate that the decriminalisation of homosexuality in New South Wales was effectively a social determinants approach to the HIV, to the, um, it happened in 1984. And it, this was, a, an, this happened specifically in response to the, what was becoming the HIV crisis. And the thinking behind it was in the net was the Neville Rand government that did this. While gay sex remained illegal, how could gay men and affected communities work with government to control and contain the HIV epidemic? Remembering that in those early years, there was no effective treatment. Similarly, the decriminalisation of sex work in New South Wales. Needle and syringe programs were another critical non-pharmaceutical public health approach, providing structural solutions for those whose risk was from needle sharing. Now, the Australian response to HIV is a story of partnership with affected communities, where communities contributed to the prevention, care and policy development. The voices of the affected communities have shaped HIV policy from the very first national strategy to the current national strategy and at every step down from the national strategy to local implementation levels. This has kept programs and policies responsive to the changing needs of affected communities. So what do we need to think about when designing policies and programs? Aim to ensure that it is easy for people to lead a healthy life. And this comes from um, the Nuffield Stewardship Model of Public Health, which was published in 2007. And I love this point. It's actually my favourite thing in, in the whole Nuffield framework is the emphasis on always trying to make things easier for the populations that you are targeting. Don't set the bar high. Don't ask people to be changing their lives in big ways. Find ways to actually get the policy that you want implemented to actually intersect with people's lives in a productive way that makes it simple for them, where they don't have to try really hard. Pay special attention to people who experience disparities, and that can be health disparities, that can be socioeconomic disparities, that can be people who are members of populations that for some reason a particular infectious disease or non-communicable disease um, is, is, uh, is, is particularly prevalent. And of course to children, because um, taking care of children's health ensures or creates the conditions for healthy adulthood. The next point is very important from an ethics and equity focus. Ensure that the public health programs that you are designing don't blame, shame, or seek to coerce people. And while, of course, sometimes public health does in, does involve some levels of coercion. The concept is that you should generally use the least restrictive me measure to achieve the, the efficacy aim that you are looking for. So if you're choosing between different forms of intervention, that they need to be interrogated to think, which of these measures enables people to have the most freedom and autonomy and to choose that measure rather than going for a measure that might restrict um, people? And the Nuffield, because the Nuffield um, stewardship framework is very much based in the idea of liberal democracies, um, one of the things that it holds quite dear is to try not to, um, to have an impact on things that are really important to the way that people live their lives. So to try not to, um, you know, intervene in private spaces where you don't need to. Aim to reduce the risks of ill health that people impose on each other. And of course, our whole COVID experience is about trying to reduce risks of ill health through, um, through changing the way that people relate to each other. 
aim to reduce ill health by regulations that ensure environmental conditions that sustain good health. And so that focus there on regulation and on um, ensuring that you have the right regulations in, in place to make um, good health easier, simpler, clearer, and to sustain that. And finally, and I've added this point, this is actually not in the kind of um, this, the pricey of the Nuffield stewardship that I'm that I'm working with here is to work with communities to devise solutions. Whenever you are targeting a particular population or community group, if you don't work with them, if you don't have the advisory group structures in place, you are wasting the opportunity to learn from the people who are most affected by um, by the particular um, problem that you're trying to solve you're wasting their lived experience, their knowledge and their expertise. People living in communities can often see solutions that we can't see um, if we are from the outside. They can also, they can analyse problems differently and it can transform public health. And I think we've, we've definitely seen that in HIV. This is an image that you're probably familiar with or at least some version of it. Equity means that not everyone needs the same thing. We must meet people where they are. Equity means actually giving people what it is that they need in order to be equal with other people. And of course, the, the final point there, justice, means that ideally nobody should be actually facing barriers to, um, to access whatever it is that, that you want people to access in any given um, context. Moving on to research, the diagram on the right here lists three critical factors in ethical and equitable research. That, re that research should be aiming to reduce suffering. That research should be based on fairness and equal respect for all. Um, and of course, I'm only going to speak, be speaking really briefly about research here because we have other um, guidance or uh, the ethical conduct of research. But keeping these three things in mind is really, really important to, to think what is, the, what is the overall aim of the research? Is it going to reduce suffering? Is it fair in the way that it is targeting people? Are its outcomes going to be fair? And is it conducted at every stage with due respect for the people who participate in it? This requires consideration of the following. Is the research justifiable by its potential merit? So does the research actually have social value? Have relevant communities participated in planning the research? So do we, we know that it, this is actually appropriate for the communities that it is being implemented in? Is the selection of research participants fair? So are the inclusion and ex exclusion criteria justified by research contexts rather or so justified by um, by evidence rather than simply by um, by convenience? Of course, there is a place for convenience samples, but we have to be careful about the idea of bias um, when we are dealing with that. Is the process of recruitment fair? Are people given a, a fair opportunity to participate in the research if that's what they want to do? And ensuring that the benefits and burdens of research are equitably distributed, you need to ensure that there's no unfair burden of participation on a particular group, that there's a fair distribution of the benefits of participation, because remember that actually participating in research can bring really specific benefits to participants, that no one is exploited, and that means that they are not used um, for the good of others with their own good being ignored in, in the research process. That every person has fair access to the benefits of research. So when you actually have an outcome of the research, what is that going to mean to the people who've participated in it? How has that been considered on the way through? How have you thought about what this participation means and how you can ensure that some of those benefits actually accrue to the people who have helped the knowledge actually um, be constructed through the research process? And finally, respect for persons requires that there's timely and clear communication of research findings so that people can, can, can benefit and can understand the value of what it is that they participated in. So finally, I wanted to show you a good and bad example of public health programming. 
So these health promotion, um, these are two different health promotion campaigns. One of them is Australian, um, that's on the right hand side, on the left hand side, it's from New York City. Both are about um, obesity prevention and both use body shaming to try to produce public health actions. So the aim of this kind of research is to try to stimulate an individual through some kind of feeling of shame to change their behaviour really unlikely to work, really likely to actually, you know, cause social problems, make people feel bad and alienated from their bodies, make people feel less, less respected in the world and less, perhaps even less likely to, that, they, that they will be treated in a respectful way when they seek um, medical health. This research, on the other hand, and I just actually saw this in the conversation yesterday, so it's very um, serendipitous, shows consideration of equity. This research is the concept of people actually being prescribed fruit and vegetables by their doctors. Um, it was in a particular trial. This was in people with diabetes. And then actually receiving fruit and vegetables for free as a, as a result of this to facilitate healthier eating. No shaming involved, directly addressing some of the soci socioeconomic determinants that contribute to poor eating habits. So in summary, the equity lens is really important in public health ethics. This includes recognition that while we should all have equal rights, we don't have equal advantages and opportunities in life. And so the equity lens is shining a light on where there is disadvantage and ensuring that more resources are put into that area. Consideration of equity in public health aims to address unfair inequalities. That's where people, people have privileges that are not fairly acquired. It's not something that they have earned. Um, it is simply there because they are lucky. And this aligns with the principle of health maximization, improving the sum total of health for all. And I just wanted to leave you with this um, little picture about the opposite of equity, just for a little bit of fun. Um, and these are my references. And thank you very much for your attention. I will stop sharing. And hand back to Maddie. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much, Bridget. That was fantastic. Um, we're going to have a QA and a session at the end. So if you've got any questions um, for Bridget or for Kez, just pop them in the chat box or at the end you can raise your hand as well and, and we'll, we'll do a, do a Q&A. So um, I'll, I'll pass over to you, Kez, to, um, to share. Thank you, Maddie, and thanks, Bridget. That was... Um... A great presentation and I think a lot of the points that I'll make echo um, what you've just discussed but from an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspective so um, just checking you can see my slides. Yeah no that was yeah. great. Great thank you so much. Um, so um, yeah I am going to be presenting uh, around equity and ethics from that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspective. Um, and uh, as Maddie said at the start, I'm from the Gunamana program. Um, just briefly, Gunamana means heal in Gumbangi language. And this artwork that you can see on the screen here was commissioned for our program um, to represent the work that we do. And it, it um, it's titled Heal Spirit, Heal Country. The brown circles that you can see represent ongoing traumas that exist within our communities. And then the, the blue purpley lines that go through represent the healing. Um, so I too would like to acknowledge country. So I'm meeting you today on beautiful Gadigal country. Um, and of course, would like to pay my respects to elders past, present, and to those um, other First Nations people who are on the call today. So some of this won't be news, but some of it may be, but just giving you a bit of a snapshot of um, uh, the world's Indigenous peoples, I'll talk a little bit from a global context and also a local Australian context as well. So uh, there's enormous diversity among Indigenous and tribal groups across the world who speak more than half of all living languages and practice more than 5,000 distinct cultures. And the term Indigenous peoples itself in many ways is quite a crude one as it isolates and homogenizes those 5,000 plus diverse cultures with vastly different experiences, needs, hopes, challenges, opportunities and ways of life into, into one um, title. 
So many Indigenous peoples have maintained a strong belief in the relationship between people, land and nature, whilst also resisting and surviving the ongoing impacts of colonisation and other forms of dispossession. Respect, support and prioritisation of different Indigenous leadership, knowledges, cultural expressions and continuity are all really essential in thinking about health equity and ethics, particularly as they also relate to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So then within an Australian context, we've obviously got Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who've occupied Australia for more than 60,000 years as the oldest continuous cultures on earth, something that I think we should all be incredibly proud of. So prior to British occupation, there are approximately 600 different Indigenous groups with distinct cultures and beliefs, speaking many hundreds of different languages and dialects. So there are a number of international frameworks which exist that speak to equity and the rights of Indigenous peoples. So I've put a couple of examples up here on this slide. So on the left here, we have the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, also colloquially called the UNDRIP. And Indigenous peoples globally welcomed the adoption of the UNDRIP in 2000 and, 2007, and Australia signed on from 2009. So the UNDRIP outlines a, a number of different articles, but it also includes um, rights such as Indigenous peoples' rights to be actively involved in developing and determining health, housing and other economic and social programs that uh, affect their communities and also the right to access without any discrimination to all social and health services. Many of the sustainable development goals, which you can see in the middle here, um, and their associated targets are also relevant for Indigenous peoples. So the importance of a rights-based approach and cultural sensitivity has been repeatedly emphasised by the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And the forum has recognised that working with Indigenous peoples on sustainable development really demands a culturally sensitive approach based on respect for and inclusion of Indigenous peoples' worldviews, experiences and concepts of development as well. And then on the other side here, um, the World Health Organization, they're also acting um, in this space primarily on social determinants of health equity for Indigenous peoples. So really looking at the causes of the causes um, of health inequities and measures to tackle those. And some of their focuses include things like strengthening uh, equity oriented health systems through intercultural care provision, integrating human rights, equity and intercultural approaches to guide public health policies, ensuring that communities have access to comprehensive, culturally appropriate and quality health services and addressing linkages between climate change and health. So then thinking at the national level, we have some overarching frameworks, specifically when it comes to ethics, um, that that we really need to be alignment with, um, in alignment with, particularly working in health research. But uh, I'd, I'd say particularly um, a number of these uh, documents that are on the screen here have um, great points that are still very relevant to people working in policy and practice as well. So um, the examples on the screen here, we've got the National Health and Medical Research Council guidelines. I put up the New South Wales Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council guidelines and their key principles as well, given I'm situated in New South Wales and they have um, a, a really amazing set of principles there um, that I urge you to have a look at if you hadn't before. And then on the right here is also the Australian Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, IATSA's Code of Ethics. So um, we're doing fairly well, I'd say, in Australia in terms of having ethical guidelines um, that address the way that we need to work in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health um, research. Um, some other countries where there's other Indigenous populations are uh, nowhere near um, as advanced in terms of um, their progression in this space, whereas there's other countries that are, are far ahead of us as well. So you may have heard this phrase before. Um, it's very simple and effective, and it really speaks to the underlying message that unifies many of these documents and frameworks, which is nothing about us without us. And what it's really speaking to is the importance of First Nations voices in decision making. 
being able to self-determine, which includes measures of what success or health and well-being actually looks like, is incredibly important. And also recognising that our cultures and communities are incredibly strong, intelligent, resilient and full of strengths uh, is often overlooked. Governments in particular often implement policies that undermine Indigenous health equity or have really focused on deficit framing. So flipping that to look at strengths framing is really important. And often discourse has been racist, controlling and exclusionary of Indigenous voices. So essentially it's incredibly important to resource Indigenous structural power to influence policy that impacts our communities. I use this slide here to illustrate the point of who, whose version of history might we have been taught and why. So upon colonisation of what we now know as Australia, the land was legally deemed to be unoccupied or the Latin phrase terra nullius, meaning no man's land. And with terra nullius as Australia's founding ideology, that's really fueled misre misrepresentations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as problematic on almost every dimension. And again, it's not a pattern that we see just here, um, but we see this in other colonised countries and a pattern that we've also seen play out, particularly within research as well. So, um, as I say, it's in other colonised areas where that colonial mindset often unconsciously um, has been consciously, but often ongoingly, ongoing is unconscious, I guess. Um, informs the writings of experts, the research that's undertaken and the development of policies that impact upon societies, including First Peoples. Um, same slide, Bridget. Um, so we, we always hear that Australia is a multicultural country and um, I just use this to illustrate that we always have been and that richness and diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures is something that we should all take pride in as a nation. So um, this is the IATSIS map of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander language groups. And even this isn't the best, um, it's just the best representation that we have essentially and is, is, um, is also missing many more. I just also like to put this slide in as well, which is a zoomed in map of the Torres Strait Islands as they're often missed or hard to see within um, the larger map of mainland Australia. So we're often taught a very Western biomedical definition of health as purely physical health, and it's quite individualistic. But for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, health and well-being is incredibly holistic. And so here on the screen is the Aboriginal definition of health from Nacho, which shows that it's about the social, emotional, cultural well-being, not just of an individual, but um, uh, of a whole community, and also importantly to country, um, our relationship with lands, waters, sky. And continuing on from the definition um, from Nacho, uh, I've also put here the holistic domains of self. Um, this comes from Guy, Dudgeon, Schultz, Hart and Kelly. Um, and this speaks to uh, our connection to uh, culture, country, community, spirit, mind, family, kinship and community. So you can see how holistic health is for us and, and when we need to be t bringing that um, understanding into the work that we're doing as well. So this slide I put in um, to challenge us all as well to start thinking beyond equity um, and thinking also about other frameworks that exist. So um, sovereignty is something that is spoken about a lot in, in our communities and I guess in the area that I work in, an equity approach can and often unconsciously assume that we as First Nations people are um, seeking the same rights or have the same challenges as other minority groups. However, um, reclamation of land, identity, language and culture really requires um, uniquely Indigenous solutions. So um, I really like this, this quote here um, from Professor Philip Mills. Um, so this slide here, uh, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about the, the program that I come from um, at the George Institute, which is Gunamana. Um, and we really are a, a program that is led by and for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and are seeking to generate evidence that privileges Indigenous knowledges in the work that we do. Um, and again, uh, really maintaining that holistic paradigm of health and healing. 
So specifically the research focus areas um, for our program are around social and cultural determinants of health, health systems and healthcare delivery, particularly looking at things such as racism within health systems, um, facilitators and barriers uh, to care, and of course being very much underpinned by community-driven priorities. The way that we work is um, far more than just being a research program, and this here represents our Gunamana model. As you can see, everything is centred in the middle there in our First Nations ways of knowing, being and doing. So far more than being a research program, um, just as importantly is the work that we do in capacity building, particularly in um, not just building capacity among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but also among um, non-Indigenous people um, who work in this space and how to do that appropriately. Advocacy and impact, um, incredibly important, particularly amplifying the messages and voices of the communities that we work with. And of course, um, partnerships are absolutely central to everything that we do. And then on the outside, you can see there that we're underpinned by core principles of being community driven, sustainable and relational. So within our program, uh, we work within an Indigenous research paradigm and we conduct research at what we call the interface of knowledge systems. So we're continually asking these questions of ourselves and also those that we work with. We know that there's a history of research being performed on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities with no real tangible benefits coming back to community. And so we're working at this interface of Indigenous and Western knowledge systems to create deeper and intercultural understandings in the work that we do. And so examples of this is also thinking about what actually constitutes robust evidence. And so, you know, we know that things such as randomised control trials are really held up as the gold standard, but are often not actually appropriate or feasible within Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander settings. And often groups that are most at risk for or um, afflicted by health disparities are by definition, small in number when compared to the larger, more dominant society. And so we really need to be developing research techniques and questions that are suitable for smaller group design and really expand our concept of um, what design actually provides scientific rigour. And I guess the other point there is thinking that the, the large samples and methods that are often demanded by um, mainstream science, Western science, may not fit with that um, local um, epistemology or cultural understanding of how knowledge should be generated and, and shared um, in First Nations communities. Indigenous data sovereignty is also um, a movement that underpins um, a lot of the, the work that we do, and, and, and it's a movement that recognises that data has been weaponised against Indigenous peoples all over, again, not just here in Australia, but in other um, parts of the world. And it's really premised on that United Nations declarations on the rights of Indigenous peoples. And Indigenous data sovereignty is really about our inherent right to govern, collect, own um, uh, and apply data uh, about our communities, peoples, lands and resources. So Indigenous data sovereignty requires that um, researchers, both in, in the context thinking in Australia, both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and non-Indigenous, to really actively engage with um, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are involved in, in work, communities and organisations, um, and really around ensuring that the reporting of data reflects community priorities, values um, and, and cultures as well. So um, this is my last slide. Um, just wanted to leave you with some transferable lessons from our ways of working within the Gunamana program. And these are some things that we've found not just work um, within the research that we do, but are also really applicable again to that um, policy and practice arena as well. Um, so valuing cultural skills and knowledge, having a shared vision and purpose, Again, that focus on holistic health and well-being. Relationships are critical in the work that we do, and particularly um, genuine relationships built on trust and respect. Ongoing communication. Um, again, that point around self-determination. So 
actually giving agency and having that decision making within communities is critical. Um, having appropriate time frames, including for things like uh, deliberation, really focusing on reciprocity, um, having a two way learning approach um, and that give and take relationship is critical. Having joint planning, monitoring and evaluation processes, uh, building on and recognising that there are existing community governance structures, um, strengths and assets. Knowing what work is already going on, um, we don't want to overburden communities that we're working with and, and recognising that um, communities might have other priorities. Patience is critical, recognising that it might take multiple discussions or interactions to actually establish a partnership, recognising and redressing power inequities, uh, working collectively and planning for sustainability and ownership. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing. Thanks so much, Kez. That was fantastic. Um, just a reminder, if you want to pop some questions in the chat or pop your hand up, um, please do so. But I've definitely got quite a, a few to um, to kick us both off. Um, but those presentations were, they were so insightful and really, I think, um, complemented each other. It was really great to see like some, the same principles coming through and, and lessons for us um, as well. I was just sort of um, thinking on partnerships and some, I was wondering if this is to the both of you, if um, you could provide us with some um, examples, Kez, maybe of, of stuff in the program, maybe an example of, of a particular research program and or um, health program that that has been really successful at at partnering and at feeding things back to community. And then Bridget, um, I don't know if you've got one from from your COVID experiences or even um, you provided with some examples of HIV, but maybe just something a bit more tangible of 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 how those partnerships actually have um, undertaken. Yeah, um, there's there's so many examples, but I think one of the best partnerships. Um, that that we have within Gunamana, and it's not just with us. It's um, also with UNSW through. Um, uh, it's called the UI and RLE partnership, which is with the um, Aboriginal community in Walgett, and primarily with the um, Dariwa Elders Group in Walgett and the Walgett Aboriginal Medical Service. And essentially, this model has flipped things on its head, um, whereby any research that is conducted in that community um, is governed and controlled by these local Aboriginal um, services, and essentially um, we've we've partnered together um, uh, to. It's almost like a, a brokerage kind of function, whereby rather than researchers coming in and and going, you know, we want to do X Y Z with your community. It's it's very much from the ground up and very much about actually the community coming up with questions and then seeking partnerships with um, like-minded research organisations, people who have similar values, who know how to work appropriately in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research um, in order to do that. So, um, yeah, and, and that partnership has a number of uh, research projects that that sit underneath it, but it's a really robust um uh, way of working and, and a way of governance that really gives that appropriate self-determination to the Wolga Aboriginal community. Yeah, that's that's I've, I'm I'm a little bit familiar with with that group and um, they've got some really great uh, programs that they're running and also they well they're well utilised like their community garden and and um, I know that they were getting some there was some water security issues and they were getting um, some proper water resources um like it just essential bubblers um that to make water available for community and that stuff is actually really valuable and useful um and tangible so mm -hmm. yeah that's fantastic uh bridget um, do you have some examples yeah. that you can share and the example that i'm going to share comes from a question that came from the community as well or a problem that came from the community and the community that I'm going to be talking about here is um, is gay men, and particularly it was was gay men who are 
and particularly were at increased risk of HIV. And there was a new intervention that for which there was pretty good evidence, which is um, pre-exposure prophylaxis, taking antiretrovirals, negative people taking antiretrovirals to prevent getting HIV. So there was evidence that this worked pretty well. Um, you know, there'd been a couple of randomised controlled trials. The Australian government was just like, no, nah, why would we do this? And so coming from um, the US, it had been approved in the US, but of course the US can approve things that they don't have to pay for them. You know, the way their health system works. And so community groups basically came to the Kirby and said, like, we need access to this. This is going to change HIV prevention. And working together, um, the community group um, ACON and the Kirby Institute put together this great big implementation study where they got the antiretroviral drugs for free. And they, so they basically set up, you know, what was a study, but it was very much a real life study. So you didn't, you know, you didn't have to be 18 to 55 and off normal, uh, normal weight, you know, all those things that they put in clinical trials to hone it right down to the most kind of perfect people. People just had to be at, you know, at some kind of risk of, of HIV, usually gay men. Um, and this trial was huge and it was, I can't, I'm not going to try to mention the numbers because I'll get them wrong because I'm really bad with numbers. Um, I'm a qualitative researcher. Um, and then other states around Australia started saying, well, we need this too. And so basically this trial expanded out and out and out, provided absolutely crystal clear evidence, even though it was an implementation study, not your perfect randomised controlled trial, nothing like that, showed yeah, this works, this absolutely changes um, the HIV acquisition in Australia. If we can give people this, this um, prevention um, mechanism, because it fits in with people's lives better, like similarly to the way the oral contraceptive pill um, really revolutionised contraception, PrEP has really revolutionised um, HIV prevention. But governments like Australia were initially really, really wary of it because it was going to cost more money. Also, the community groups, sort of while the trial was taking place, started negotiating for getting generic access to the drug, so that actually getting generics into Australia so that you weren't having to pay um, massive sums of money. So that was incredibly successful. And again, it came from researchers listening to what's happening in the community, listening to needs that are coming from community members and there, and working with them in partnership all the way to make sure that you actually got the research that you needed to solve the problem, but also that the research itself was a good, you know, getting on that trial was a good thing for people. You know, it stopped a lot of uh, a lot of men from acquiring HIV who otherwise probably would have. So that's my story. Oh, thank you. No, they're both um, really great examples of partnership. Um, and conversely, I guess I was also wondering where, um, have partnerships potentially fallen short? Um, and I guess what are some of the implications for when um, when we don't partner meaningfully um, with communities and, you know, some of the the ethical and um, equity implications that, that can occur from, from that? I think um, in my context, thankfully, we've come a long way. I think there's a lot of examples from many years ago, and I'm sure there's still a lot of research out there that hasn't necessarily kind of addressed all of those principles. But um, I think what's good is that we do have these quite robust um, kind of guidelines and, and ethical bodies to, to advise and to give that um, extra layer of security, I guess, in terms of making sure that research that is done in, um, and this is from a research perspective, that is done with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities must meet a certain ethical standard before it can be, um, you know, given the go ahead. So I think essentially it would be the the flip side though of of that last slide that I showed with all of those lessons. You know, um, the where it doesn't work well is where there's not agreed to timelines where things are rushed, where there's not uh, genuine partnerships, you know, where people are flying in and out of communities and not actually um, building those relationships on the ground with people. It's where there's um, projects or programs that have no um, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people in decision-making positions um, where there's no appropriate governance structures in place. Um, 
and and a lot of this is what has occurred historically but um yeah i think there's a lot of great research that's happening out there now and really really flipping that so so my bad example is also about prep and it also involves unsw um in fact some of the same people um so you know things are done, can be done right and done wrongly and this was um about 10 years before when they were still trying to actually prove or you know get the evidence about whether prep actually worked and there was this trial planned in cambodia and the reason it was being planned in cambodia was that there was really really high incidence of hiv in women sex workers and so terrific let's trial this new hiv prevention thing in women sex workers the things that went wrong they were partnering with probably the wrong group they were kind of partnering with the instead of partnering with grassroots, um, the kind of grassroots movement. They were kind of partnering with an agency that was not quite embedded in the community. But also the trial was planned among a community where some of these women sex workers, their whole families depended on their income. Um, they, you know, they were bearing the brunt of, you know, extended families sometimes. The idea that they might, so the, the idea of getting HIV sort of in the future was much less um, scary to them than the idea of actually taking a pill that might cause side effects. Um, all kinds of things went wrong. Um, women were afraid of what the medicine might do, the side effects of the medicine. There was nothing clear in place to say that if they got HIV while they were on the trial, as you would expect that some would in a randomised controlled trial, there was nothing saying we're going to link you to antiretroviral therapy because you deserve it, because if you have participated in this way, you should be given that reciprocal um, benefit of we will then take care of you for your life so that you will you know, live a long and healthy life as people with HIV do. Um, so none of those things were worked out and they were working with this population who were so... Um, who was so dependent on their health in a very, very immediate sense that anything that interfered with that, and, and people felt that the trial was would exploit them. Um, also, there were things like the, um, the funders wouldn't do things like actually release the protocol publicly so that people could actually go through it and see. So there were all of these different levels of dysfunction, misinformation, inability to meet the people that you were asking to participate really on their level. Um, and if you if they'd spent enough time just asking people, do you want this? Is this something that might work for you? And actually, I think those people would probably have said, well, no, not if you don't know that it works. Um, you know, at a later stage, you know, in, in 2016 or something, yeah, absolutely, once you actually have the evidence. But this was not the group of people to try to um, prove the efficacy or not of that intervention. Awful mm. stories. So basically coming with an idea and trying to insert yep. it into a into an environment where um, there's potentially not really actually the the interest or the um, the buy-in and the yeah the partnerships just not not really there. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, they're really great lessons. Um, really great examples and things to sort of bear in mind um, when we ourselves think about how we conduct research and um, and also with our policies and programs when we're looking at designing them and implementing them. How are we thinking about partnering with those that that these programs and policies are going to impact? And have we, you know, are we talking with people about what they want and need? Um, I guess we sort of we're, we're running out of time, but we've. I did just sort of want to touch on um, the strengths framing that you mentioned, Kez, but also I think it kind of aligns with stuff that Bridget was talking about in terms of shaming. Um, I think like, you know, flipping it instead of, you know, the negativity and um, looking at deficits and things like that, you know, um, we do hear about it in, in public health in, in a lot of advocacy, trying to think about how um, the positives and the strengths and and what we're sort of looking for. Um, so I guess how do we, when we're thinking about strengths framing and I think it's often maybe done a bit better with newer research or policies or programs, maybe not perfectly, but 
Um, what about when we kind of look back um, at things that are already in place? Like, uh, is there a way to kind of um, take a strengths framing and um, and look at stuff that's already that's already there and look at improving it? Yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the key things that is important in thinking about strengths framing is that it's not it's not about not pointing out that there's an issue. So I think sometimes people get confused and think, you know, if I'm if I'm needing to come at something with a strengths based approach, like how can I do that if there's clearly an inequity here? Like how do I do that? And I think it's it's about going beyond just describing a problem for the sake of describing a problem. Um, and you know, I think in in the case of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health, like it's um, sometimes as as simple as looking at you know uh, when I started presenting, I'm talking about the absolute strength and resilience and um, existing governance structures and ongoing cultures that have lived for many many thousands of years. Um, it's putting that up front and, and recognising um, this incredible um, strength and richness of diversity and culture rather than um, starting by describing a problem and um, associating um, indigeneity or Aboriginality with being the problem. And I think it's it also comes back to as well, um, you know, we're, we've been talking about social and cultural determinants today as well, and I think thinking about the way that uh, what are those causes behind the causes of inequities and, and pulling those out and, and looking at systems that create inequity um, uh, rather than focusing on, on people and gaps and deficit. I think that's really critical in, in flipping that, that framing. Mm, yeah, no, that, I totally agree. Um, Bridget, do you have any, any thoughts? I have been reading a lot of qualitative research at the moment in um, people with larger bodies and their responses to the way that they are treated in by public health campaigns, but also in um, in the clinic. And I have found this incredibly, um, incredibly moving. And again, I mean, it, it shows me how like how, you know, we talk about obesity as a problem and we try and there's this kind of public health gaze that seems to locate a problem in people's bodies instead of seeing, um, you know, again, the strengths of people who are living in larger bodies and listening to them about what actually might help them lead healthier lives. And the, the really, like, to me, the desperately tragic thing that comes through in some of this research is how people who might be at greater need of things like cancer screening and who might be at greater need of having a really good relationship with their GP to make sure that, you know, whatever their body's size, that they are getting the care and attention that they need are alienated from, from the clinic because of these stigmatising attitudes that that prevent that. So that's something that I have been getting quite excited about um, recently. Drives me mad. Yeah, I think yeah, we there's a lot of um, people within our network that um, that work within the the space of food policy and obesity prevention, and and I think there's um, a lot of lessons from the past. Um, you know, you provided some examples of of old campaigns, and there's a lot of rebranding of um, of some campaigns, um, you know, shifting away from obesity or the term obesity and some of that yeah. that stigma, and it's always been a problem. Um, this certainly doesn't take away from the the, the health issues of, um, but strengths. Thinking about um, the strengths framing, I think, is really really valuable. And I hadn't really thought, Kez, about um, putting that up front. I've often, you know, with my um, my advocacy hat on, you know, you come with a problem and then you've got your solution and that's your strengths framing. But putting that forward and and placing that at the very beginning, I think, can really frame things in a, in another way and and storytelling and bringing in um, bringing that to the front um, just is really quite valuable. So I think, yeah, thank you for thank you both for for reminding um, me of that and. Um, we've hit uh, midday, it's 12 o'clock, so um, 
I'm weary that we've we've come to an end. Um, but thank you both so much for your amazing presentations and for this great, great discussion. Um, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, there will be a recording available. We'll send that around um, to everybody that's registered into our network. And um, just a reminder as well, if you've got colleagues that want to join our, emer our emerging leaders network, feel free to to share um, to share this with them um, as well. So thanks again, um, and yeah, we will um, all have a great afternoon, and we'll we'll be in touch. Thanks so thanks, much. Maddie. Such Thank a pleasure you. to present Thank with you, Kev. Yeah. Bye. Likewise. See you later. Bye. Bye. Fantastic.